Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Funk Chronicles. I'm your host, Dr. Turk Logan from Logan Communication and the Funk Music Hall of Fame. Today I have a very, very special guest from way out west, Miss Don Silva. Don, how hey, you I'm, doing? I'm doing wonderful. Good morning to you, soldier. Hey, I am, I am truly a soldier, and it's afternoon here, so, you know, I know we're on two different time segments, but that's quite all right. You know, I just saw a video of you performing, I saw two. I went on uh, uh, the internet and saw a, a video, uh, and boy, that 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 funky tune that you guys did. What is it called? Oh, I, I am the one. Is that is that the name of the on tune? The one. Yeah, it's called On the One. Boy, to see uh, four beautiful females out on stage, three or four beautiful females doing the funk, that just blew me away. Boy, I love uh, that. Well, wonderful, honor to, well, uh, wonderful. Thank you. I wrote that about a. Uh, you know, funk never, you know, never gets old. It, you know, funk never uh, is. It, it, it just doesn't die. It keeps going. That actually, that song was written. What year was it, Henry? Back in back 1980. in the 1980. Okay. And so, we, and we draw. I dropped that uh, in the new millennium 2001, and it just kind of blew up. You know, I got a lot of license deals behind it in Europe. So Europe's picking up with the funk and running with it. So that song did really well for us. Well, I tell you, obviously, because it was well performed on stage and it, you know, being a, a, a funketeer myself, uh, I, I just was excited in, in a few minutes I watched it. I also saw you guys performing with, uh, as the Brides of Funkenstein with the, the legendary George Clinton in Parliament Funkadelic. That was just... Oh, yeah. yeah, that's where we started. Actually, the Brides started with Sly and the Family Stone. Okay, okay. Oh, and then we were we were a special guest act, kind of sandwiched in between Bootsy Collins and P-Funk. And we went on a mm, two-week tour. Sly left the tour early, and George liked the sound of the bride's uh, uh, vocals, you know. So, oh, well, it wasn't the bride's then. He liked Sly's, we were Sly's girls at that time. And he really liked the uh, background vocals, so he asked us to come uh, out and do some sessions with him. Well, I'm, I'm glad he changed his name from Sylvester Stewart to Sly. <laughs> Cause I don't, oh, think, yeah. I don't think Sylvester Stewart would have gone over very well, but Sly did. <laughs> I like Sylvester. I like Sylvester. You know, they had another singer in in uh, San Francisco that did well. His name was Sylvester too. So okay, maybe I think I think maybe that's why he may have changed it a bit. Okay, but Sly, Stone it seems hard. He was aggressive. Sly Stone, I think, is a worked better, much better. I used to call them the Sly and the Family of Little Rocks. So yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Did you ever have a chance to work with Junie Morrison with the uh, with Parliament Funkadelic? Oh, absolutely. You know, Junie. Uh, wow, he wrote quite a few songs. Uh, but what? First one was One Nation, one Nation Under a Groove. Uh, <laughs> Needy. Junie wrote those, and 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 the brides, uh, along with a sister group, Parlette, stacked all those vocals. I think it took us probably a couple of weeks to do both those songs just the vocals alone you know because back in those days we didn't sample anything there well, was i no went to high school with junie and he's from dayton ohio so we we've known each other for many many years and I, i've seen his growth with uh the ohio players i've seen his growth with the i band and also with uh parliament funkadelic with george clinton so you know we have a history together and i know how talented he is talk about uh, the Brides of Funkenstein today, uh, Dawn. Well, the Brides of Funkenstein right now, we just finished a double show uh, in Petaluma, California, where we, March 27th, 28th, packed to the, to the rafters at both shows. A uh, cute little funky eclectic club on the, on the side of the ocean. And my, my band, uh, the Brides' current band is now based in Los Angeles, the majority, so they all came down. Petaluma is close to San Francisco, so it's like north northern California, and we just performed and um, we we actually were uh, showcasing a new song called No Funk on the Radio. That's coming out probably in June. Okay. We also showcased a single that's dropping next week. Uh, 
that Jesse Johnson from the time produced for us. Okay. And uh, that's, we did a remake of Funkadelic's I Betcha. And right now it's only available on an Indiegogo campaign that launches in about three or four days. So it's one of the perks. Um, we're going on a, the Brides of Funkenstein's second honeymoon tour. Okay. So it's going to go 2015, 2016. Dayton is definitely, definitely on the list. So I'm so honored that you guys reached out to us this morning or this afternoon for you. And um, because, yeah, Dayton, Ohio, along with Akron, I think Toledo, is it Toledo? Youngstown, okay. Cleveland. Okay. All of those are on our list. You know, uh, we've, it is a wish list right now. But we're going to the fans and asking the fans to actually uh, – donate to this campaign so we can go on this world tour. Well, that's you know, good. We have, I, you, go ahead, I, baby. I'm uh, honored to own my own radio station, internet station, so we want to make sure that we get your new product so we can expose it and get it hot by the time you get ready to come into the market. So we'll talk about that at uh, off air. But one of the things that I have a lot of respect for is the uh, legendary George Clinton. And I know you have worked with him for a number of years. And I got his, or oh, he got my attention when he did the Mothership Connection. And one of the things I noticed about George, he's a great gimmick person. He's a great marketing person. And I was at the concert when the Mothership came out of the ceiling at the University of Dayton. And America had just sent a... Uh, space shuttle up in space and i okay. said okay this is where this is coming from this is real unique what george would do he would tie his some of his shows into some things that were happening globally 20 25 30 years ago and i just thought that was very very unique well george he, george has always been like light years ahead of everyone else very creative individual he surrounded himself with individuals who were just equally as funky and freaky and crazy. Um, as far as the marketing, the, the gentleman that actually manages the Brides of Funkenstein, his name is Henry Mayer. Okay. He, he's the one that did all the marketing for the organization. So okay, good. Okay. I, I can't give, I mean, George is, is a genius and he's done so many things, but marketing, would, that's a whole nother ball game. But Henry actually took Bootsy, made his album go triple, I think, I believe his album went triple. The Brides of Funkenstein, if it wasn't for Henry Mayers, we wouldn't have had a top uh, number seven R&B hit on the Billboard charts. Disco to Go was a single. There it you actually, go. It actually blew up and sold like, I think, 300,000 copies uh, in about, what, 30 days? Yeah. So it's still climbing. It still ma amazes me because it's still selling to this day. Um, the list goes on and on and on. He's responsible for cooling the gang. I mean, you keep going on. Well, Henry Mayers worked this behind off for the organization at that time was called Thang Incorporated. Right. Yeah, um, but it's back to the music. Yeah, George is, a, is a, a funk referee, a musical genius, and he surrounded himself with thoroughbreds, and I'm honored that he gave me that opportunity because I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it wasn't for George Clinton. Well, con congratulations, Henry. You, you need a person. I'm glad you, you told us about this guy because he's just, uh, he sounds like he's phenomenal of what he does. He's sitting right here. Wait, wait. Uh, you know, Wait, did you brush your hair? <laughs> there he is. That's yeah, Henry. hey, Henry. Uh, That's she's, Henry. she's giving you your, your endorsement, and, and uh, the thanks for joining us and getting everything set up for her to come on the show. I have the uh, pleasure of working with Parliament Funkadelic and George Clinton on a personal note and on stage. Um, when Junie was living in Dayton, George was in. And I saw Junie and George, just the two of them in Junie's basement. It was just the three of us um, playing the keyboards and just working out on a tune. And it was phenomenal to see these two guys together. I mean, just two musical geniuses together. And then um, just several years ago, George came in and worked with um, a label that was in Dayton called Ernie Green Entertainment. And he produced a song called P in the Funk. And boy, it was it was a hot tune. I, we played, as a matter of fact, today, uh, I'm still playing it. So, you know, every did time say, George did, comes did in. P, did you say P in the funk? P in the funk. The P stands for party, though. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> you know, I, I like but, that one. Yeah, I, I, I like that one, too. And, and, and it was done right here in Dayton, Ohio, and, and did well. 
But again, like I was saying, every time George comes in, we um, exciting things happen because George is just like you said, he is a genius and he's a standout. And um, he, he, you know, you you know, you've worked with him many, many times and and okay. over the years. Now, when you go out on ro on the road, you're going out with Parliament Funkadelic, and and, and the Brides of Funkus Night would be separate. Well, that's how it happened back in the day. I think we went out for the about three or four years. We played about 300 dates a year, pretty much. That went on. I mean, 300. That's that's uh, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. That's almost six shows a week, you know. So, and we had maybe Sunday off sometimes. But um, now, no, we're actually the Brides of Funkenstein are actually exclusive. We're going out on our own now ourselves. We're actually looking for groups to link up with the, maybe some of the Ohio groups like Zap. We would love to go out with Zap. Well, uh, Zap, even though Roger and, and Larry are no longer with us, Zap's still hot right now. Yes, and, they are. They're, they're, they're blazing. And, I'm, and I'm, we're really good friends with those guys. And we toured. I actually worked with the Gap Band um, when I left uh, the Brides and P-Funk for, for a short spell there. I went out for, with the Gap Band, which actually was supposed to be one tour, and it turned in 11 years. Mm. So I remember uh, Zap was uh, one of the regulars that always opened up with uh, with for the for the Gap Band, and um, so I became very close to those guys. I've always wanted to tour with them because we have the same market, so we're actually pretty much independent now. That's why we're dropping that Indiegogo campaign so we can be more self sufficient. A lot of times you have to go through agents, and they kind of got the market kind of uh, what is it? Uh, Back up. Locked up is a good word. Okay. Where it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard for independent artists to get into some of the the, the uh, clubs now. It used to be a lot of mom and pop shows. Sure. Like the club. Like the club we played uh, over the weekend was independent. It's not on the list for the the agents list. You know, like the, so we actually have what four to six million fans out there. Yeah. We just have to have the means to reach them and the fans can actually bring us to their city, to their country, their town. And that's what we're doing. So Zap actually would be perfect along with groups like Cameo. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. The Brides pretty much have an eclectic following, whereas it was the most diverse shows I've ever seen. On Friday night, it was the regular Funketeers. Uh, hardcore that drove all the way down from Los Angeles. You're talking about driving a thousand miles. People came in from Mexico, Seattle, China. One guy came in from Kansas. One guy came in from Moscow, okay, to, to a 600 capacity club. But the very next night, it was totally different audience. Okay. Never seen anything like it, you know, it was just Grateful the Grateful Dead crowd, you know, oh. the Latin King crowd. So it was Latinos, uh, you name it. I was like, hipsters. you know, hipsters, funksters, baggers, ballers. I was like, what the heck? I've never seen anything like that. So I know that the Spunk merger has crossed over. The appeal for the Brides of Funkenstein is because we haven't been out together as the Brides of Funkenstein in, and we haven't played the, the Bay Area 30 years. Well, you so know, one of the... Believe. People didn't believe we were coming, so we are definitely coming to Dayton. That's, that's, well, that's a question. And we're definitely, we're definitely going to welcome you. I know you were talking about how the house is, and I'm sure Henry, if he wasn't around, he should have been around because in 1971, um, we did a concert at the Lakeview Palladium. And the Lakeview Palladium was a relatively small house at the time, about 1,500 to 2,000 people, which was a relatively small house for that time. And the artists that you would normally see there would be B.B. King and Muddy Waters and Bobby Blue Bland and Johnny Taylor. So that was the audience that was at the, the concert. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was just so funny because I was standing backstage and this was my first experience with Parliament Funkadelic or the Funkadelic. And all of a sudden the, the stage went black and a, a, a blue strobe light came on so it kind of just caught everybody off guard that was sitting out in the audience. And when the spotlight came on, it came on a casket. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and this casket opened up real slow 
And uh, out step, I, you know, I, I finally got a chance to meet Poo Poo Man. I, I would imagine that was him back then, but it might have been George. But no, uh, in the 70s, no, I don't think Poo Poo. Uh, okay, uh, then it must have been George then. Out stepped, the, out stepped this guy smoking something with a diaper on. And, uh -uh. and the audience just freaked out. It was so funny. I just died laughing. It was so funny that security, because we had the off-duty officers, shut the show down and put everybody out. You know, they did not, the, the group did not get a chance to even perform. 1971? <laughs> was that was in 1971. And, uh -huh. and it was just amazing to see this group perform at this venue, but then later on in, in years, they put them in the right match with the right demographics and the right groups of people and whatnot. And we you know we followed George for the last 40 years in his career. And he seems to always rise to the top. They say cream rises to the top, and that's okay. what he seems to do. Now, okay. you ladies, I, I had a chance to view two of your videos, and one was with uh, you, it, you, you, you. You're labeling it Dawn Silver and the Brides of Frankenstein. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, that's good. That's good. So you're out front then more than anything. Actually, I'm out front along with uh, another lady named Jeanette Washington Perkins, who uh, my sister group. She actually was one of the first females to sing with uh, Parliament Funkadelic. And she toured with them about maybe two, three years before the I even uh, joined the group. Um, and our, yeah, so Jeanette actually is a sister group. George created two female groups. The other one's called Parlette. Now, Parlette was the... Ver was the uh, more hardcore version of the female groups. They were like the funkadelic of okay. uh, females. Really raw, hard, racy, no hold, no bars, hold, held girls. I mean, hardcore. Okay. And they're, and Never seen them, but okay, okay. No, I know that's the that's the travesty of it. It's, they just basically, uh, for some reason, they didn't get the exposure that the brides did. But they were actually our sister group. They were signed before us. They were on. Casablanca, and they they went out and did a handful of tours. Uh, I think at that time for the industry, because like you said, George coming out of the coffin in 1971. So even as 1978, seven eight years later, their st industry still wasn't ready. We weren't a radio radio friendly group at all by any oh. stretch of the imagination. Well, trust me, I know. I I, I was there. And, I know. And know. I know. I think we were the only group that got away with smoking weed with the audience, and there was no problem. Everybody knew. If you went to the funk concert, you was going to get high. Well, you know? that, that, that's what I was saying. And, you know, trying to bring that music back then on a, a, a 50,000 watt FM radio station that was not, it was a black program station, but it wasn't black owned. Exactly. It wasn't. <laughs> it so, was I, mean, just, they, I think the industry did everything in their power to suppress it. I think it's gone back to, into suppression mode, too. But that's why we're basically the fans are not having it. Right. That's why the rides have actually been able to sustain now is because we have this major underground following. Now we've been relegated back to underground market, whereas okay. at one point we kind of, you know, blew a mud hole into the whole system and we became mainstream. You know, it became number probably P Funk became the biggest group in the world at one point. What? But back back to Parlette, the sister group, they were just a little too hardcore for that that era. Right. You know, coming out of the wigs and the bouffons and the Supremes and the gloves and the rhinestones and uh, gowns. These ladies were wearing the same thing that pretty much that Madonna and Lady Gaga are wearing right now. Okay. They set, okay. They set the trend then. So you know, it's just they were just ahead of their way ahead of their time. And and, and as I, George and as George has always been ahead of his time with his even the Brides of Funkenstein. Where did the where did the name the Brides of Funkenstein come from? Well, it was from the bigamous. The album cover, um, the clones of Funkenstein. He had okay. so many different characters, and okay. each each entity had their own identity. So the brides were the big and Miss George Doctor Funkenstein was was the ultimate space pimp, right? Okay. Character. So if you're gonna be a space pimp or any kind of pimp, you're gonna have more than one lady, right? More right. than one leading lady. And so he ha he he uh, cloned the brides of Funkenstein. The, Two women, the bigamous brides of Dr. Funkenstein. 
And Norm, we've got about five minutes. We could sit here and probably uh -oh. talk all day about the music business, but there's something I want to ask you. We are okay. in the process of building a funk museum here in Dayton, Ohio, um, similar to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's going to be an, an educational piece involved in it just as well. Give me your take, and even though you're not from the area in Ohio, but give me your take on the importance of us doing that. It's 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 like it has to happen. It's like it's not like a, a great idea or a great concept. It's something that's totally needed because our music is being systematically, I believe, wiped out. The, the face of R&B music has, is changing colors. I think country and Western is turning into the new R&B. And I mean, I've noticed some of the uh, listening to maybe the radio sometimes, TV, and um, we're system, I think we're systematically being uh, eliminated. I'm just going to call it like it is. So this museum actually will keep the legacy of what we created. All of the groups, such as your groups, my groups, and you know, as a whole, we need to come together, united under one uh, funky groove, and put and put these museums out. Not just in Dayton, but in every city, there should be a museum in order to maintain the integrity. In the essence of the music of what we created. So that museum is definitely, definitely needed. So when Janetta reached out to me and told me about your your concept and your museum, I was like, absolutely. We need one here in Sacramento. We need one in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Chicago, Detroit, every major city across the, the United States, Europe, and everywhere else. And, and it's a must. It's a given. It has to happen. That's how I feel about it. Well, if you ever run across one of my students out there in California, you would recognize her. Her name is Omarosa. And okay. uh, she was on The Apprentice with Donald Trump. And since uh, she likes the funk music because her mentor taught her that. So if you ever run across her, tell her Dr. Logan said hello. And what's, also, her name again? what's her name again, please? Omarosa. Omar, Omarosa. I remember Omarosa. She was like, yeah, I remember her. I, <laughs> I figured, I figured I she, was. she was like, yeah, I remember her. She yeah, got kicked I, off the show, right? Right. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I remember her. Okay. You guys, were hit, you guys were hit it right off. You know, you would hit it right. But I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. When you come in the market, you know, I want to make sure that I at least get a chance to see you guys perform. And also, I want to make sure that we support your music as well, because like what you said is very true. Uh, from that perspective, and even though we're on the internet, we don't fall under the guidelines of the Federal Communication Commission. So we've got right. um, uh, also we also are looking for paraphernalia. So if anything that you have to donate to the museum or anything, please make contact with uh, Janetta or David Webb, the president, so we can make sure that you guys are represented. Absolutely. Well, well we've got a few things over here. We'd love to send your way. Okay, good. Somebody will make contact with you and, and, and they will hook it up. But, oh, that's great. How about that one? Boy, that's amazing. That's, that's, is, is that you and Sly? It is. Oh, my goodness. I, I recognize, hey, boy. How, how, many of, how many of these do you need? Oh, as many as you can send us. You got it. All I need is an address. Yeah, well, uh, somebody will make contact with you. And thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Um, Thanks again, Dawn. Dawn Silver from The Brides okay. of Funkenstein. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And hope to see you before the year's out so we can pick up where we left off and have some great conversations about the music business and the funk. Funky in here, you know. And thank you again. Thanks for joining thank us. You. All right. Thank it's, you for having me. All righty. Dr. Turk Logan, once again, for The Funk Chronicles from Logan Communication and the Funk Music Hall of Fame. We just talked to Miss Dawn Silver from the Brides of Funkenstein, Funkenstein really, the Brides of Funkenstein, and uh, had a great time chatting with her. We'll see you next time. Thank you.